stars with Patrick Moore in the sky at night. I'm not in England, but in the sunnier climate of the Canary Islands. In fact, I'm on the top of the extinct volcano of Los Machachos. Um, I very much hope it's extinct. And it's here that we've set up our latest and most modern observatory. You'll get a magnificent view from here. You can see for miles and miles and miles. On that clear day, as now, you can even see the island of Tenerife, which is as far away from here as Birmingham is from London. Here, on La Palma, we have the dome covering the Isaac Newton 2.5 metre telescope, transferred here from its old home at Hurstmanser in Sussex. And next to that, the dome of the one metre Captain telescope, named in honour of the Dutch astronomer Jacobus Captain, the discoverer of star streaming. Like most modern observatories, this one is truly international. Britain, of course, plays a leading role, along with Holland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Germany, and of course, Spain. There are many telescopes here. There is the Swedish Solar Tower. There's the Danish Carlsberg transit instrument, which snakes star positions automatically. There's a new Nordic 2.5 meter telescope, which has already proved to be a great success. And there's also a German experiment concerned with uh, gamma rays from space, which looks at first sight rather like a collection of telephone kiosks. But the largest telescope here and actually the third largest in the world, is inside this great dome. It's the 4.2 metre William Herschel telescope. It's named in honour of William Herschel, discoverer of the planet Uranus and possibly the greatest observer of all time. He was actually Hanoverian, but as he spent most of his life in England, I think we can justifiably claim him. Last time we were here, the William Herschel telescope was being assembled, and we were able to show you the great mirror on the workshop floor. Well, now everything is fully operational, so let's look at the telescope itself. As you can see, it's rather squat. The tube is a skeleton, and the mounting is alt azimuth. That's to say, there are two moments, up and down in altitude, or east and west in azimuth. This is different from many large telescopes which have an equatorial mounting, where the axis is defined by the rotation of the Earth. The alt -az construction uh, enables cost savings to be made in the telescope and particularly in the dome. The drawback is that the telescope does not naturally track the stars. However, uh, the tight computer control we have updates the telescope tracking information 20 times a second and this enables us to track a star to one arc second accuracy and to point to one arc second accuracy. The telescope has five focal stations, the five positions where we can put instruments. Two of these are called the Naismith foci. The Naismith foci are the strong platforms where one can put heavy pieces of equipment. Okay. On this Naismith platform we have the grill enclosure which is a thermally uh, controlled hut which has an optical table in it and this is used for experiments which require great stability and most of these experiments have to do with high resolution imaging, very high spatial resolutions or with very high spectral resolution experiments. On the other base with platform we will have uh, the shell spectrograph which is currently being constructed at Utrecht and uh, this is for very high resolution spectroscopy of stars and quasars, point sources and uh, this is shell spectrograph uh, will be ready about December this year. But there is some fairly weighty equipment on the end of the telescope now. This uh, spectrograph behind us is called ISIS. ISIS is a, a double beam conventional spectrograph that is effectively two spectrographs. The first thing that happens to light as it passes into ISIS is that the beam is split into two, a blue beam and a red beam with a dichroic filter. Each beam then goes to a diffraction grating. We have two diffraction gratings for the blue and the red. This is the red one here. The diffraction grating is something like a plain mirror, but it has uh, rulings which split the light up into its various wavelengths. Uh, this particular grating has 158 rulings per millimeter. 
it's actually the coarsest grating we have. Uh, it's used for separating the red from the green, from the yellow from the blue, and analysing the light. I say it's a very important instrument, but it's not a permanent fixture. No, indeed it isn't. We have another instrument called Taurus, which can sit on the telescope exactly where ISIS is now. I've been using Taurus in its direct imaging mode to look at uh, shells around elliptical galaxies. Now, uh, what these are are the remnants of mergers of galaxies in, in the fairly recent past by astronomical standards, maybe only 10 million to 100 million years ago. Uh, small galaxies have fallen into ellipticals and form sharp-edged structures. And by looking at the sharp-edged structures, you could tell something about the galaxy which fell in, but perhaps more important, you could tell something about the distribution of mass in the parent galaxy. And the distribution of mass is often very different from the distribution of light, and this is one way one can probe the so-called dark matter, which may make up a large fraction of the mass of the universe. Professor John Baldwin has been using the William Herschel telescope for a very special program. He succeeded in doing what no one has done before. He's recorded surface details on a star. And since we normally regard a star as a point source, that is quite a feat. I gather that the star you've concentrated on so far is Betelgeuse. Well, that was the first one, and for fairly obvious reasons, it's very bright and it's very big, and you obviously try to do the easiest thing first. What results have you got so far? Well, it was quite surprising to me, anyway, that uh, you, one might have supposed that one would see a large red disk quite rather uniform. But in fact, it had uh, one very bright spot on it. We don't resolve it very in much detail, but it's about 10% of the light, ho the whole of Betelgeuse comes from this one spot. And what do you think that spot is? Well, people surmise that this is convection in the deep atmosphere of uh, Betelgeuse and that there are only a few convection cells on the whole atmosphere of Betelgeuse, whereas in the case of our own sun there are very many millions. Since the star doesn't actually show a measurable disk, how do you record the detail? Well, we've been using the William Herschel telescope here and, uh, as you may know, the, the light from the star which uh, arrives at the Earth is very strongly disturbed by the Earth's atmosphere where stars twinkle. Uh, if there were no atmosphere, then the telescope would produce images of stars with very, very fine detail, 40 or 50 times better than they do now. But, uh, so our problem, and that's what we've been trying to do, two of us, is to sort out the atmospheric jumble. Uh, and the way to do it is, in principle, really rather simple. Uh, we are taking the light from the telescope, and the telescope tube itself is just beyond here. We are actually standing on part of the telescope itself in this room, and the beam of light from the star comes in through the hole in the wall. And at the moment, we've just got a small light box here uh, so that we can make an artificial star during the daytime for lining up our equipment. And that shines onto a small hole in a, in a plate here. But this metal plate is being looked at by a TV camera so that we can align the star, and when the star disappears from our screen, it's gone down the hole in the middle. The light then, from the focus here, goes through a lens at this point, which turns the light into a parallel beam, going through an iris here, and this parallel beam then goes on, and from this lens, the light beam is then focused down just inside the black card, uh, beyond which there is a microscope objective, uh, a small lens which tilts the light beam upwards onto a CCD detector which is uh, enclosed inside this dewer here which is cooled with liquid nitrogen. Now in the control room here we have some of the data and here we have a picture of an artificial star with uh, crossed by these very fine fringes which are the effect of producing two very small apertures right out at the edges of the mirror uh, in effect. Uh, and we see that we can see detail now, which is not just a second of arc, which is the size of the star, but very much finer. Now, to get the data in, we want to squash that down so we don't have to record so much. And then we can stack it up. That's one picture. And on top of it, we put a whole lot of other pictures. And we get 512 pictures as a time sequence. Now, if there were no atmosphere, you see, there were, the fringes would be absolutely straight, as in this case. But now... When we look at the actual sky, of course, the atmosphere is moving around, and as you see here, in the case of the star, we see the same fringes, but they're moving about madly. 
and uh, that's the thing that we have to unscramble. Now that's a simple case because it's just two apertures right at the edges of the mirror showing very fine detail of milli arc seconds. But now we want to do something more complicated, so we have lots of holes, and then you get a picture, as on Antares last night, uh, and this is the picture, and this is the data that we now have to try and analyse. The control room of the William Herschel telescope contains many terminals and computers. We have here some of the most advanced electronic equipment in the world. Professor Michael Rowan Robinson had been using the William Herschel telescope for studies of special kinds of galaxies. We've been using the William Herschel telescope to study galaxies detected by the infrared astronomical satellite, IRAS. This was launched in 1983 and detected over 70,000 galaxies. The advantage of the infrared is it gives us a, a wonderfully clean picture of the universe. Uh, we use the WHT to measure the spectra, uh, the redshifts, and hence the distances of the faintest and most distant of the IRS galaxies. We use the faint object spectrograph, which is part of ISIS. We're now coming towards the end of a big survey. We've altogether now have the redshifts for about 4,000 galaxies. And this week, we're measuring the very faintest and most difficult ones, because they're also the most interesting, very luminous galaxies. With this survey, uh, we're, we, we're able to do a number of really interesting cosmological studies. First of all, we've essentially weighed the universe, and we find that probably 99% of the matter in the universe is dark. Uh, the second thing we're doing is studying the evolution of galaxies over the past few billion years. And we find surprisingly strong changes in the galaxy population. Basically, it seems that a few billion years ago, galaxies were undergoing much more frequent violent bursts of star formation, perhaps because uh, collisions between galaxies were more common then. And then the third kind of study we're, we're carrying out is to map out very large structures in the universe. There, are, there seem to be some structures which are uh, as, as big as a billion light years in size. And one example of these has been called the Great Wall of Galaxies by Harvard astronomers. Well, we've been mapping that, and we've also found other structures at greater distance of these enormous sizes. And these just are not understood yet. What does this tell you about the past history of the universe? Well, I think it uh, poses a problem for the current ideas about the universe. Uh, basically, the, the, the popular model at the moment is uh, the inflationary model. Uh, and then to make that work, you have to assume that there's a very large proportion of cold, dark matter in the universe. Well, we seem to find that dark matter, but that model does not cannot account, it seems, for these very large structures. So there is a headache there at the moment. What are the main advantages of using the William Herschel telescope for this kind of work? The combination of the, the huge mirror and the very good sight with its uh, tremendous speed of operation and its very good instrumentation makes it uh, tremendously fast for studying these faint objects. In a few minutes, we measure the distance of a galaxy uh, billions of light years away. And then, a few seconds later, we're ready to start on the next one. And to give an illustration of this, when Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe in the 1920s, he measured one redshift in a night, whereas we've measured 120 redshifts in a night with this telescope. We mustn't forget that although the WH team is the largest telescope on Las Machachos, it's not the only one. And frequently, several telescopes are used together in some particular research program. In fact, this is happening at the moment with an international program concerning active galaxies. The WHT, the INT, and this telescope, the one meter Jacobus Captain Telescope, are all being used. Dr. Michael Penston is a member of the team. Michael, I gather that you are a lag. Yes, I'm, I'm a member of the lag collaboration which is the lovers of active galaxies. And the LAG collaboration uh, formed itself in order to respond to the International Scientific Committee's call for international proposals to use 5% of the, the telescope time of all the telescopes in the Canary Islands. We have astronomers from uh, various European countries, France, Spain, Germany, um, Holland, United Kingdom as well. 
And we've been carrying out a program which is to determine the lag, in fact, what the response, the delay in the response of the emission lines to changes in the uh, continuum of active galaxies. What exactly is an active galaxy? Well, you can call it a mini quasar, if you like. Uh, quasars are very luminous objects, very small and compact. Many of them are very far away. Some of them were shining when the universe was uh, only a tenth of its present age. But the active galaxies also exist less luminous in much more nearby galaxies. And these are more advantageous to study for a number of purposes. How's the program going? Well, we started in January, and we've been taking data. We'll finish fairly soon. Uh, we've been using the William Herschel telescope and the Isaac Newton telescope to take spectra, which tell us uh, from the emission lines about the behavior of the gas around the nucleus and with a smaller telescope, the JKT, to monitor the continuum, which is the behavior of the light bulb in the middle of this mass of gas. You're using the CAP-10 telescope, which is smaller than the others. It's only a one meter. Is that a disadvantage? Well, not for this purpose, because the continuum light is brighter and easier to measure than the emission lines. And so a small telescope is quite, quite adequate. In addition, it actually provides an important calibration for the other observations on the larger telescopes. Dr. Fiddle Charles had been using the William Herschel telescope for a very special investigation. We were about to start a three-week commissioning run uh, here with the WHT and uh, heard the, the exciting news of the discovery at Arecibo of a very rapid radio pulsar, one of the, the most rapid known, uh, with a 1.6 millisecond period. That's 600 times a second this neutron star is spinning. But uh, what makes it uh, an important object astronomically is that the radio pulses disappear for part of the time showing that the system is eclipsing and that the uh, binary period is 9.1 hours. Now the VLA, the Very Large Array in New Mexico, obtained an accurate radio position to a tenth of an arc second which meant that we could attempt to study this region optically and search for an optical counterpart. Now we did that just with the accurate radio position. We had no finding chart but we relied on the superb pointing of the William Herschel telescope and very quickly found a variable star. As you can see, the pulsar is at the top of this close pair, and on the right-hand side, you can see only the bottom one remaining. The pulsar has gone completely. The, the star at the bottom, in fact, is just a contaminating star that happens to lie in our line of sight. It's not physically related to the pulsar in any way. The separation, though, is only 0.6 arc seconds, and that shows why it is such a difficult object to study. Uh, that separation is much less than what we used to think of as good seeing at astronomical sites. Now, the star at its brightest is 21st magnitude, whereas at its faintest is below 24th. The large range in optical brightness indicates that something extraordinary is happening to the companion star. And uh, what, what, what is going on is the rapidly spinning neutron star, the pulsar, has a very powerful pulsar wind that's flowing out at very high speed with uh, energetic particles, very high energy protons and electrons, which impinge upon the face of the companion star that is towards the, the neutron star. Now, when we're looking at that face, we see the heated face towards us. Now, the material that's heated up actually starts to boil off the surface of the companion star, hits this wind and forms a shock and is blown back around so that the companion star sort of looks like a comet with a cometary tail. When the system, about five hours later, we're looking at the other side, the non-heated face, and it's that tail which will obstruct the radio pulses causing the eclipse that's seen. It's extraordinarily faint, as I said, below 24th magnitude. And therefore, it's a very cool, very low mass system on that side. But it, that's such an extraordinary thing with this very rapid pulsar. How did this come into existence? Because um, 20 years ago, when the Crab pulsar was discovered, it was thought that the only way you could get a rapid pulsar was in the collapse of a supernova. Spin it up, and then it would just gradually spin down. Well, this is obviously not, an old, uh, not a young system at all. It's very old. Uh, that means that the pulsar has to have been spun up. Now, that's the, the key again is the companion star. Uh, earlier in its history, the companion star would have been transferring material into an accretion disk which would surround the neutron star and spin it up. 
and uh, with time it would spin faster and faster and faster. And at, during this phase, it would be a very bright X-ray binary, of which there are, are many now known, uh, studied from X-ray satellites. But eventually, the companion star will literally run out of material, and uh, the mass transfer will stop. The accretion disk will gradually all transfer onto the pulsar, and then the pulsar mechanism, which uh, the, the high magnetic field, which will uh, accelerate, will be literally a giant accelerator to cause this pulsar wind to start evaporating the companion star, that's the system we have now. But how much longer can such a system survive? Well, the answer is, in astronomical terms, not very long at all, only about five or ten million years, and the companion star will have been completely evaporated, leaving uh, an isolated, rapidly spinning pulsar, which will gradually, uh, by the pulsar mechanism, run down uh, and uh, become just like any other uh, neutron star. Is this particular pulsar system unique? This system is definitely unique. We are searching for others, uh, but this is the only one which is doing this to its companion star. This great telescope is now fully operational, and we've seen some of the things it can do. But what about the immediate future? I think the one field which is going to explode, if I may use that word, is high-resolution imaging. And it's going to explode here because we have the sky, we have the telescope, and we have the, the ability to use the Naismith platforms for experiments so necessary to develop different new optical imaging uh, techniques. That's one field. And the other field, which I feel very excited about, is the distant surveys of galaxies, which with new uh, instrumentation at the prime focus, together with developments on ISIS, in which we shall be able to measure the spectra of large samples of objects at once, these developments will give us the capability of measuring large numbers of redshifts of galaxies very quickly, very efficiently, large numbers at the same time, which gives you the, the in, increase in efficiency of the telescope. If you can measure 50 spectra at once, it gives you an increase in speed of 50. So therefore, uh, those are the, the programs which excite me, the, the imaging capability, the survey capability, which I believe will, will crack wide open numerous fields in both uh, stellar structure, stellar dynamics, and the formation and evolution of galaxies. Here at La Palma, under conditions as good as they are anywhere on the surface of the Earth, we have some of the finest telescopes ever built. Of these, the greatest is the William Herschel Telescope, the largest ever built in Britain. Our main hopes in astronomy are centered here, even though we must never forget that La Palma is a Spanish island and Los Muchachos is a truly international observatory. Much has been accomplished. Much more will follow in the near future. We can be proud of the William Herschel Telescope, and it's also fair to say that this observatory atop the old volcano is as spectacular as any in the world. Thank you.